So um, this, is a, this is a really special occasion uh, for us to have Larry Smarr, who is the, the founding director of NCSA, and I, I think you probably all know that. Um, so I'm, I'm the fourth in a line of, 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 of directors of NCSA, so I'm Ed Seidel, if, if there may be some of you don't uh, know me. But um, uh, Larry, uh, you say this common thing, you know, Larry's the kind of person who needs no introduction, but I think I, I will say a few things about Larry. So I came here, first of all, um, in 1989 as a postdoc of Larry, who had founded the center a few years before. And uh, like everything Larry touches, um, my, my life and my career totally were transformed because everything here was new and exciting and there was this connection with people like Donna Cox who were doing uh, artistic scientific visualization and I had no idea what that was or even supercomputing, I really had almost no idea about that. I had no idea about computational mathematics and I met uh, many, many people who just touched me and transformed my whole career because of being here at a very special time. But with Larry, sort of everything is a special time. So I would just say, um, if you don't know this, I could say with, with certainty that we would not be here uh, in this building. We wouldn't have this building. Um, we wouldn't have a Blue Water supercomputer. We wouldn't have an entire national program of supercomputing. Uh, because Larry, who was a, an astronomy professor here in the early 1980s, um, felt he didn't have any computer power that he needed in order to address uh, his research problem, uh, which was at the time doing colliding black holes, trying to solve Einstein's equations. So he just said, well, we need a program uh, to create uh, supercomputing capabilities for the country. And so he submitted a proposal to NSF to create that. But it wasn't just a proposal to a solicitation. It was a proposal for which there was no program at all. Uh, I guess you had a, a grant, I think you told me you had like a $14,000 grant or something like that from the NSF at the time. So you submit a proposal unsolicited for something of order $50 million to the NSF. And this is 30, more than 30 years ago. Uh, and out comes not only NCSA, but in fact a whole series of supercomputing centers that really has transformed the way science and engineering are done, the way industry operates, and so you know what Merle's program is, the private sector program, is in many ways an outgrowth of that. And so there are many, many things like that that Larry has done uh, that have just really changed the world. And so as you know, we've done a lot of strategic planning where we talk about um, NCSA, you know, it's time to change the world again. Well, this is the original changer of the world. <laughs> and uh, it's been such a pleasure to, to have Larry as, first of all, as a, as a postdoctoral mentor, and then just as a friend and a, and a mentor uh, throughout my entire career. And today, uh, Larry is going to tell us about uh, one thing that's been one of, a passion of his for many years, which is about, in effect, a big data freeway system. But he's going to tell you a lot about you know, what were different versions of this same idea over the last decades and where it might go in the future and how we can play a, a role in helping Larry with that going forward. So look forward to your talk, Larry. Well, thanks very much, Ed. It's, of course, great to be back here. Uh, you know, it's like, as I'm looking at the audience, there's like a million flash bulbs going off in my mind of memories of the uh, great things that uh, we did together here and have continued to do for 30 years since we started in CSA. Um, so I'm going to talk about this single vision. And I'm going to spend probably a third of my time on the history of how without NCSA and the efforts that you led uh, for the last 30 years, there'd be no ability to recognize and, and make this vision real. Uh, sometimes you just kind of, it's so busy, you forget how many amazing first went on here. But the idea is simply to use light paths over optical fibers to do what's logical, connect all data generators, whether they're scientific instruments, computers, whatever they are, and consumers, which of course now there's a billion generating data every second all over the world, and create essentially a big data plane that integrates with global high performance networks. And the way to think about this, and this is from Phil Papadopoulos, 
at SDSC. If you think of, you know, what does it mean to have your data co-located with your computer? Well, your computer say a cluster. Well, it means that the data can get to any of the processors, but how fast can they do that? No faster than the back plane of the cluster. But what if that speed is available anywhere in the world? So all you've got is speed of light latency, and as the lambs remember, light gets around the world seven times in a second, so you know that's not a lot of latency. So, but if you could have that, um, everything would change. Now, this vision has been there for two or three decades. And it's only now that it's finally being realized. For instance, here's the canonical picture from uh, the first XMP we had here in 85. That's John Kogut. It was a two processor uh, supercomputer. John had one processor for quantum chromodynamics, and the rest of the country had the other processor. And John felt that's the way it should be. He didn't understand why he had to give up the other half. But um, now, forget the details and how this led to NCHA Telnet and eventually the other software development tools, Mosaic, uh, you know, changed the world, added a trillion dollars a year, the global, national, you know, global product and things like that. Just focus on, there's a data generator, in this case a supercomputer. The computer that he's using is the ones his fingers are on. <laughs> which, by the way, was a one-year-old Macintosh. <laughs> it had been introduced the year before. Remember the Super Bowl commercial? That was the year before. And what's that on the floor? That's the network that's connecting his Macintosh with the supercomputer. So here's the architecture, and the rest of the talk is going to be about a stronger version of exactly that architecture. It doesn't get much simpler than that, and it started here 30 years ago. Data transmission. Okay, so data, data, data. Now, how we had the chutzpah to put this on, I think it was because I was half as old as I am now, and I didn't know any better, and I had people like Donna, Bob Haber, Bob Wilhelmson, all the incredible crew that made this possible. But we decided, wouldn't it be cool if we just emulated the future using analog technology? And we got a big satellite dish outside of uh, CAB, I guess, and um, used, you know, like the newscasters were using <laughs> to bring you the news from Lebanon on the evening news, and, and used a satellite transmission to take Bob live from the parking lot in CAB uh, into SIGGRAPH. Uh, in Boston, and that's Donna and me uh, on the show with Bob Haber. Uh, we did all this interactive visualization of supercomputers, you know, running this interactive visualization on the, on the supercomputer and visualizing it live in Boston. And we had uh, the temerity to go and ask the vice president uh, to, uh, or vice president-to-be, I guess, uh, Al Gore at that time uh, had just helped get the um, supercomputer center and internet programs funded, and uh, to give a video for us. And what did he say? We're using satellite technology to demo what it'll be like in the future to have high-speed fiber optic links between two advanced computers on, and two different places. That's what we're doing now. So it was like real clear, and NCSA demonstrated to the world that you could do this. And that was 1989. Well, then in 95, I was program chair of supercomputing. It was in San Diego. We wired up the convention center for the first time ever with fiber optics. I remember the biggest problem there was a, um, there was a uh, big fight with the unions because the plumber union said it was a pipe, the fiber optics. And, uh, and they had the right to, to string it and be paid for it. And, and the electrician said, no, uh, it's hooking together all these things that plug into the wall, so it's clearly a part of the electrical system. And the telecommunications union came in and said, no, this is a telecommunications device. And we had to wait for the unions to have some big powwow and sort it out before we could move forward. Anyway, but the point was that that was the first time that the three uh, telephone networks 
ATT, uh, Sprint, and, and MCI, uh, together with the Baby Bells, interconnected their networks. They'd never done it before. I mean, imagine that today, right? Like, you have to get special permission to go from AT&T's network to Verizon's network on your, I mean, really? <laughs> this, was, this was it the first time. That's only 20 years ago. And so we put on all these demonstrations of integrated systems tied together by networks at that time, this was a super network, um, driven by science. Then the NSF decided to change the supercomputing center program to the uh, PACI program and down selected the two supercomputers to NCSA and SDSC. And this was our image for what we were doing. Notice what it is. There's a bunch of universities hooked together by the newly arrived BBNS network driven by science. And over here is half the thing is the properties of the network. That was in CSA. You were doing exactly what I'll talk about later, the Pacific Research Platform has just been funded to do. And it was with the best network available at the time. And, um, you know, the, the, the thing about this is instantly, this is when we had our big Alliance 97, we did it with virtual reality to boot. And so this was the uh, famous taking the supercomputer simulation of Chesapeake Bay, including its life forms and the salinity and all this stuff, having a shared digitally defined space in which people across the country entered into that virtual space and totally different hardware, walls, immersive desks, VR labs and everything else, and then used what uh, Donna and Bob and their team had developed with um, Virtual Director to actually be able to record all that, make it um, a completely coherent collaborative environment. And that was within the same year that the Alliance started. So my point here is that this, I, this thing of, of, of using the super network, you have been doing that ever bit as much as you've been using supercomputers for your entire history. Now, as I was about to leave, the last thing I did was to work with Tom Defani and Rick Stevens, um, Charlie Catlett, to, uh, the governor had said, look, that supercomputing thing worked pretty well, what's next? And we convinced them that it was gonna be dark fiber, optical fiber. And so the governor actually put this in his state of the state uh, message uh, about the future of Illinois depending on fiber optics. And um, uh, it was funded, the True Grid project, I don't know how many remember that. Uh, but again, you'll see what you just upgraded to four 100 gigabit links that same path <laughs> you had back in 99 as the basis of what became iWire, the first of, well, along with iLight in Indiana, the first two states in the country to deploy their own dark fiber uh, network and to have high def definition streaming medium, computational grids, even cloud computing. This is a slide from 1999. Larry and Sergey were, you know, essentially just getting out of graduate school at Stanford. <laughs> the Google Cloud didn't exist. The word cloud didn't exist, except here it did, and in CSA. And optical switching, you know, does that look like supercomputing talk to you? Okay, so you were at the forefront, and this really positioned Illinois to be the leader in the country. Now, while they did a lot with the dark fiber, they really didn't seize the opportunity uh, to drive forward. Um, so I went to um, San Diego, UC San Diego in 2000, and got there just as the governor of California, Gray Davis, had this idea of creating, using the surplus, surplus, remember those days? <laughs> the surplus in California, to invest it so that it would give back to the citizens of California for decades to come, and he created the four what are now called Gray Davis Institutes of Science and Innovation, I was asked by UCSD to become director and put this together. And over the next 
five years, we built uh, these buildings, designed and built these buildings at Irvine and San Diego, um, about a thousand researchers, all these different kinds of convergent labs. Um, uh, but notice that as we first started talking about the place, we said linked together by optical networks. And in fact, here's our two auditoriums. The one on the screen is in Irvine, and the one in below is in San Diego, and that's how we have meetings. So we just fuse the physical spaces together. They just happen to be, you know, hundreds of miles apart. But um, and then um, I decided. Uh, well, long story short, about how we work with President Clinton's uh, Information Technology Advisory Committee to convince Congress to move a billion dollars a year into NSF for what were called information technology research programs. Um, and then I put together uh, a team uh, to um, create this Optiputer project. And it was, again, doing what we've been, you know, going back to science by satellite, you know, in 89, it was using super networks to meet the needs of data intensive researchers. Now notice, I didn't say supercomputing researchers, because they're a subset. They generate data, yeah, as lots of other folks do with gene sequencers and telescopes and everything else. So already back then, we had noticed that the notion was that you're a digitally enabled researcher. I mean, you've got data. And so then the issue is, how do you get that data between your collaborators? And how do you do it as the data gets exponentially large? And we developed these things following uh, uh, EVL's lead uh, that uh, did the first of what were called OptiPortals, which uh, were these scalable LCDs, um, used to have these great big uh, boundaries between the screens, don't so much anymore. But if you'll notice down at the bottom, NCSA was a partner, as with everything I've ever done, right? And in fact, in August of 2003, I took this from the annual report of the Optiputer to NSF. Uh, Jason Lee at um, EVL, uh, keeping the internet protocol, but taking the transfer and changing it from TCP to what was called, in that case, Reliable Blast UDP, uh, because for long distance, high bandwidth networks, TCP is not a necessarily a good idea. And using the TerraGrid backplane between the, that connected the supercomputer centers at NCSA and SDSC, we're able to achieve 18 gigabits per second out of 20 on a file delivery. That was 2003. That was 12 years ago. And NCSA was at the heart of it. Well, I knew that besides just file data, the other key kind of data was streaming data. And so um, I'll just show you two slides that bracket January and, and December of 2005. That was the year the buildings at, NCS, at Cal IT2 came up. And at that point, I gave, I guess, the first high definition lecture across the Pacific over fiber optic uh, cable. And to do that, the only place on the West Coast that had an HD studio that was hooked to the fiber optics was at the University of Washington. So I had to fly from San Diego to Seattle and get full pancake makeup because they said, you know, you're going to be on high definition. It'll show every pore on your body. You've got to have, and you know, it was one of these ladies who has all the stars, you know, pictures all around her mirror and everything. And that was the way you did it just 10 years ago, right? And I gave a lecture to the uh, JGN2 network uh, meeting in Japan to Professor Oyama, who's the father of uh, high speed networking uh, uh, in Japan. And at the end of this talk, which was this very complex talk on the optiputer and all this technology, I said, Professor Oyama, um, what do you think? And instead of saying anything about the technology, he says, I can see every hair on your head. 
<laughs> that was what was so experientially strange about it. That was just 10 years ago. And um, by the end of the year, actually halfway through the, uh, September, I guess, um, the building still had bulldozers outside, you know, and we nonetheless decided it would be a good idea to throw an international conference. Uh, and in particular, we ended up, um, we had about 100 fibers coming into the building. So we had this ability to link to people all over the world. And we ended up with 21 countries driving 50 demonstrations at one or 10 gigabits a second uh, into the building. And this is just a picture of one, um, some of you have seen before. The folks down here are on the stage, in our, like here, on the auditorium, and behind it is uh, a 4K uh, uh, video stream, that's four times high definition, from um, Keio University, which has the lead for digital video in Japan. Um, and you know, there's our chancellor, there's the president of, of uh, Keio University. And I, I often say, who looks realer, you know, who, who looks most real in this picture? The people in Japan or the people there? Because they're virtual and they're physical. <laughs> and that, of course, was the beauty. We had the first 4K projector in the country in, in this building. And, um, and um, notice that even compressed using um, NTT's uh, JPEG 2000 compression, you still had to have a half a gigabit sustained flow just to get the 4K through, right? So uh, these gigabit networks were really the basis of what then became a whole decade of uh, working with the, uh, all seven of the studios and all the international um, cinema groups in our Cinegrid program that meets annually at Cal IT2. Um, now, once again, NCSA was in the center of it. This is a picture. I admit it might have been photoshopped a little bit uh, <laughs> for effect. But this is our auditorium, and that is the work of Donna and Bob Patterson uh, on the tornado. Uh, it is, the data is sitting on a server here at NCSA, and it's streaming over the optical fibers in real time to uh, the 4K projector in our auditorium. Uh, and this was something that we did pretty routinely, I guess, uh, multiple times. So um, I ended up getting to be put by the Department of Energy on first their supercomputing advisory committee, and then I got transferred to their ESNet, their uh, Department of Energy uh, uh, Network uh, Policy Board. And I was listening to how DOE was doing all these great things, building these 10 gigabit uh, networks across the country, hooking up all the national labs and so forth, and, um, and to their supercomputers, you know, like at, like at Oak Ridge. And I said, well, you must be then using the super networks that you just paid all this money for to provide access to the end users of the supercomputers that you paid all this money for. And I said, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I said, well, that's kind of crazy. Would you like me to get a user and see if we can't see if this can be done? And so I went back and I talked to Mike Norman, who had 5 million SUs to do you know, evolution of 3D cosmology uh, at Oak Ridge at the NSF um, supercomputer. And um, Mike was just in the process of building an OptiPortal uh, in uh, SDSC. Uh, and we started working to get an end-to-end -end 10 gigabit workflow. Um, and essentially to think of the OptiPortal as kind of a, 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 you remember the Kogut picture? Well, this is the new Mac. Okay, this is the interactive portal <laughs> to the supercomputer. It's just that instead of being across the room, it's across the country. Um, and we were using, instead of that little cord you saw, uh, 10 gigabit optical fiber that uh, DOE had put in the SNET, 
And then, as long as we're doing it, Argonne had just required a 256 um, uh, GPU cluster. Um, and I guess it was 200 uh, uh, quadros. And um, Mike said, well, why don't we just, as long as we're coming from Oak Ridge, why don't we just stop, since it's connected by the network, in Argonne. And so what he could do is take the, the data that was otherwise what he called locked in a black hole in the supercomputer center at Oak Ridge, because he was trying to inter, you know, get to it across the shared yeah. internet, which is like, you know, was a thousand times slower than the 10 gigabit. Um, and so he would send the data to Argonne, the GPU cluster would turn it into three-dimensional movies of different, you know, the gas density, the dark matter density, and so forth. And then they would be displayed on the wall. And then Rick Wagner, who was his graduate student at the time, developed a really nice little set of scripts. So you could interactively change, you know, like which variable you wanted or, or what, uh, you know, how much depth to go into the nested grids and so forth on the movie. And it would just essentially in real time recompute from the data flowing. And the flow, the data is just flowing, you know, wherever, because it can't. And so it completely changed the scientific methodology for getting discovery out of the data that you'd computed halfway across the country. So I took it back to DOE and I figured, okay, now everybody will be doing this, right? And in fact, that same year, I gave, invited um, keynote to the TerraGrid conference. And I, you know, used this and I said, okay, so, you know, the supercomputer centers, uh, NSF supercomputer centers, right? Let's just go get your users and let's start doing this. I just never believed it would be six years later and it still wasn't happening anywhere. Because we could show that essentially we had all the pieces now for this integrated, what we call, everything was an opti then, because uh, of course it's optical fiber that's connecting everything but an integrated national cyber infrastructure system which can take streaming video, do telepresence. This is an electron microscope in Japan uh, that is used by Mark Ellisman at uh, UC San Diego. You had the OptiPortals. You had these. This was our first generation optical uh, patch panel switch um, uh, at, uh, in Cal IT2. You had clusters you could link to. You had these were the uh, video images um, in um, NCSA. Uh, and you could link this whole thing through the National Lambda Rail, which had all the optical network across the country, into TerraGrid. Um, so why don't we have this today? Well, Arden Bement, the director of NSF, made it quite clear why. And he did it back in 2005. And this is from a, pa uh, a, a um, uh, paper that uh, Phil Papadopoulos and I put in, in um, this cyber infrastructure journal. Um, and you don't have to read the whole thing, but you can, what Bement said, and Bement was not a fiber expert, right? <laughs> Um, he said, high-speed data lines crossing the country are the equivalent of the six-lane superhighways, but networks at colleges and universities are not so capable. Those massive conduits are reduced to two-lane roads at most college and university campuses. He said, improving cyber infrastructure will, tr will transform the capabilities of campus-based scientists. 2005 is 10 years ago. But still, not much happened. But as a result of Arden's interest, there were working groups that were set up across the country, and one was called the Campus Bridging uh, Network uh, that I was on, and that delivered a, 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 a uh, that was gathering all of the shortcomings of our, just depending on the shared internet for everything, uh, from data intensive scientists across the country. At the same time, the Department of Energy was engaged in, in, in building out the concept of what is now called the Science DMZ, which is an unfortunate name, but there it is. Um, and what it meant was, like a demilitarized zone, there is a separate 
networking zone on the campus for high-end data intensive science that's separated from the regular internet and its firewalls and is set up for massive interactive data mobility but secured in a different fashion from the traditional um, campus. And so on our campus, we have 30,000 users of the shared internet, and that, all that traffic is funneled over one 10 gigabit path. And the thing here is to say, no, you can have for yourself the same 10 gigabit path, and you can have another one. And the thing about optical fiber is the miracle of it is because of the lasers, you can, um, you can have, just like on a radio, you have channels, and you can have like up to 110 gigabit channels on one fiber. So it's, imagine that your back plane of your campus is on one of those paths, and you've got 99 in reserve for the scientist who at some moment in time says, I gotta have my data now. And you fire it up, use it, and it goes back into the pool, ready for everybody else. And that has been sitting in the ground in most campuses for 10 years, unused for that reason. So once the DOE came up with this idea, with it includes things like dedicated systems called, dedicated, uh, called data transfer nodes that are in this special place, this network architecture, and that performance and measurement is a big part of it. Well, thanks to Kevin Thompson, uh, one of the best program officers I've known in, in, in my uh, near uh, 35 years of NSF funding, um, he listened to both what was going on at DOE with the Science DMZs and this report that came to him from the community called the Campus Bridging Report and set up a program called the uh, campus Cyber Infrastructure, uh, CCNIE, uh, and put out a call for proposals. And lo and behold, over 130 campuses have now been funded at roughly a half a million each to build a science DMZ on their campus. This is transformational. There are only two other moments in the last 30 years of this consequence for the nation's networking for academic researchers. One was 1985 when we coupled the newly formed five supercomputer centers with NSFnet at 56 kilobaud. That was the shared big pipe across the country. The second was the VBNS that enabled us to build the Alliance uh, and the NPACI program in which uh, you now had the first high-speed access to campuses. And when that program was over after a few years, that became Internet 2, that formed Internet 2. And then this, is the next one. So about every 15 years, you get a step function. And this has just happened. And so here's an example of what one of those looks like on our campus. This is our prism at uh, UCSD. Phil Papadopoulos is PI, I'm co-PI. Um, and in Cal IT2, there's an Arista, which is just a, a couple rack thing that can, that can switch uh, over 500 10 gigabit paths simultaneously without blocking. It's sort of amazing if you think about it. It's terabits a second, right? And um, that's by Andy Beckelsheim, who was one of the co-founders of Sun and has brought us many wonderful technologies over the years. And so the fiber was pretty much all in the ground, but what we would do is light up a path to say the third floor of the physics department where the particle physicists were, or to the gene sequencing lab, or to the protein data bank, or down to SIO where they're doing climate modeling. And all of this is sitting separate from the shared internet that all the students and all of you doing email and everything are, are on. So we've been building this out over the last couple of years. And then Mike Norman was PI of one called Cherub that gave a 100 gigabit extension from SDSC to Scenic and from Scenic to the Internet 2 and Glyph and the rest of the world. And, if, and those two are highly coupled uh, at 120 gigabits a second, so between Cal IT2 and SDSC. Now the second big innovation was uh, we developed under PRISM was how do you terminate 
a 100 gigabit flow, I mean a 10 gigabit flow. In other words, if I come in and, and say, I've got really good news for you, I'm giving you this optical fiber and now you get a thousand times as much data per second into your lab as you were before I gave it to you. And the bad news is, where do you plug a fiber into? <laughs> Anybody got a, I mean, you got a Cat6, okay, Net, you know, Ethernet thing to plug in. Where, where do I plug this into? And where's my bucket <laughs> for a thousand times as much data, right? So we realized this was a problem just because whenever you have a network, you have to have a new device engineered. So the wireless, you know, internet that's everywhere, every aspect of these smartphones is optimized for the bandwidth that the cellular internet and the Wi-Fi gives and not a penny more, okay? And, and so we decided that we needed to invent the tele, you know, the black Bakelite telephone that terminated the telephone system. And so we just get these standard PC racks, we fill them with standard Intel multi-core uh, flash memories, GPUs, but we optimize it for big data and for big data flow. But of course, they're only a few thousand dollars, less than ten thousand dollars, and so we can just we just get a table and we just make these things, and then we drop ship them and we put them out on all the campuses and UC and um, you know Stanford and places like that. Uh, and so now we have sort of a uniform end point, but also you have a very capable system to work on your big data in your lab. This is sort of the next generation of the Mac that Kogut was using. Just give me an example with Rob Knight, who's my collaborator in the human microbiome. And what you can see is we've redone the campus infrastructure at UCSD so that we put one of these Fiona's in his lab, and then all of the computers in his lab are just Cat6 internet. They go into the back of the Cat6 on this thing. But then it has a 10 or 40 gigabit optical interface card. And so you just plug in the optics to that. The gene sequencers over in our uh, sequencing core, they are connected to these optical fibers. They all come over to the, uh, that's what the Arista looks like in Cal IT2, in our Qualcomm Institute. And then they go to our wall where we can do all kinds of uh, visualization of the genomic data. And then there's over the 120 to uh, SDSC where it goes to either Gordon Comet or he happens to have a thousand processor cl cluster himself. So, and then we do this, a separate thing like this, for every one of the scientists. Now, it's, it's, it sounds sort of redundant, except the fiber's already in the ground, right? It's only a, another PC when you got hundreds of PCs in the building already, right? So it's actually incredibly cheap to do this. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, for instance, flowing the data from uh, the Mark Ellisman's uh, lab, the, cat, the mouse brain, uh, up to our wall. Um, so I don't want to get into a, a, a you know, detailed thing like this, just to, accept, to say that this is, when I was chairing the Advisory Committee for Cyber Infrastructure at NSF, we recommended that they take this campus bridging report and lead to this program, and they did that. Well, I showed this slide to all 10 of the UC campus CIOs, and the University of California Office of the President CIO, and I said, look, we got six of these things at UC. Somebody's going to figure out <laughs> that the next logical step is to hook them together. <laughs> but we have, in our state, Scenic, in which we as a member of Scenic have been paying all these years, so we have one of the best optical regional networks in the world ready to plug in too. How about it? <laughs> and so, uh, and Scenic, of course, and uh, Internet 2 had just upgraded to 100 gigabits a second, and that led to the Pacific Research Platform. And that's the map of all the campuses. The ones in blue already had received these NSF awards uh, for their campus infrastructure. The ones in green hadn't, but had other reasons, other ways of handling it. The, you see the back plane there from uh, Scenic, and then you see the partnering sites uh, we went out to Hawaii and is then to Chicago to show extensibility because NSF was funding this, which this was, has, has actually a start date at the end of this month. <laughs> but we've been working on it all year uh, while the project was under review. 
And it, you see, we hook onto Starlight, to University of Illinois at Chicago, to the NSF Chameleon uh, cloud test bed, and already internationally to the Netherlands, uh, Japan, Korea, and Australia. And uh, IMRIN, for instance, uh, around Northern Illinois is a partner, as is uh, Joe Mambretti at um, Northwestern, and Jerry Sheehan, who some of you may remember, uh, who's now the CIO in Montana State. And so we have a, a EPSCOR state uh, engaged as well. And the whole point of this is it isn't, Scenic already had been all along hooking the campus gateways routers on the campuses together. This now hooks any researcher, scientific instrument, cluster in whatever room and whatever building they are into this. So it's actually end to end. And that's quite a radical change. And so we then, of course, instrument all this stuff. And you can see here, just to get an example of the kind of speeds we're getting, uh, 9.6 out of 10. This was already back um, in February. Uh, we got all the network engineers at the campuses. They all wanted to work with each other to show that this could be done because, you know, there's all kinds of gotchas when you have multiple domains. The campus have got one set of rules for their networks. Scenic's got a different set, right? When you, you, you do, once you do ping and you so that you can get from this computer to that computer and you run a test, it turns out that out of 10 gigabits, maybe if you're lucky, you get 100 megabits <laughs> until you optimize, think of it as tree roots in the sewer pipes that have to get rotor rooted out, right? Anyway, we got some of the best network engineers in the business, and now we're getting 36 out of 40. Well, the final thing I want to just mention is that all of this is driven by science teams. So the NSF grant, which is a $5 million grant, a million a year for five years, none of it can go to the scientists. That's the rules. But in spite of that, I have over 50 leading scientists that signed letters of commitment to this NSF grant to demonstrate that they can use this uh, for, the, for their work. And the way I did that was I knew I couldn't convince scientists who weren't working with somebody at another campus to do this with no money, right? So I went out and found pre-existing scientific teams that were multi-institutional already and that were big data and were therefore not, I knew, being able to move the data back and forth between the team members over the standard internet. And so we have them in astro uh, particle physics, astronomy, you can read it. Um, and just to give you an example, the open science grid is a big part of this um, that is supporting um, the LHC data analysis. Uh, and one of their, the executive director of the open science grid is a co-PI on this proposal. Um, uh, we, uh, are, we have two starter projects that will um, prove out a lot of the things you'll be doing with LSST um, as well as the Dark Energy Survey here at NCSA in a production mode. And between now and five years from now, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to prototype. And so these are two other projects that are underway uh, that are partnering with us. Um, uh, here's an amazing one. Uh, David Hausler, who's one of the top researchers in uh, biology at Santa Cruz, um, got a big NIH grant. Uh, as you know, there's a revolution going on in cancer using the genomics of the cancer cells. And so one of the ways to do that is to bring together all the patients. Uh, you know, each time you have a cancer, the mutations are quite different. But if you can pool all that data, you can find things that mix the right chemotherapy with the right genetic problem that, you know, breaks that you've gotten sort of. But instead of putting it in a Santa Cruz, like he had the human genome data center before, he put it in the colo facility at, at SDSC because of the networking. Because the whole point was people were gonna be downloading this. Well, 30 petabytes have been downloaded by the community as this thing, in just the two years it existed. And now they're streaming the data. You can see there down there, that's 15 gigabits a second sustained, where it says 15. And, and you know, that was back at the beginning of the year. That's the kind of demand for just one biomedical database. 
Um, I'll just say an example. I've been, as you know, very involved in turning my body into a genomic observatory and uh, sequencing uh, my gut microbiome uh, over time, uh, and as well as a lot of the healthy people at NIH uh, funded for the Human Microbiome Project. So we, we actually, my team computed over 25 CPU years, core years. I'm finding core years as a better term than all these hundreds of thousands or millions of SUs. Um, and we did it on Gordon because that was the first big data supercomputer. But also, guess where? In Champaign-Urbana. That machine is in your research park at our systems, run by Brian Kuchik, who used to run the machine room here at NCSA. And we've now got a 10 gigabit link from um, Cal IT2 into that machine. And I was just emailing with Brian this morning about getting another big chunk of time to, to do this. And in terms of software problems, this is, I won't take you through it, but this is the kind of incredible software framework that it takes to take the data coming off the gene sequencers and end up with how many of each kind of bug do you have at this moment in time in your gut. And there's thousands of different species, and you've got, by the way, 100 trillion of those in your gut. And I'll be talking on this Sunday at the Carl Woese Symposium. Um, climate change, every 10 years, we, we have to do a 10-year projection, 50-year 50, 50 projection in regions in California based on the global climate models that are done at NCAR. So we now have uh, the new Wyoming Supercomputer Center for NCAR has agreed to put a 10 gigabit directly into our Pacific Research Platform so we can download those and then subgrid them for uh, California, which it turns out the Scripps Institution of Oceanography is the lead on. Uh, same goes with earthquake simulations, uh, effects on buildings and so forth. Uh, they're actually using supercomputer simulations in real time coupled into those shake tables. Uh, virtual reality, uh, here's the, the, over there is the uh, Cave 2 at EVL. How many of you have been in the Cave 2 at EVL? Okay, you guys ought to be on that. I mean, you should be taking big blue, data, uh, blue waters data sets and getting them visualized in that over your, I mean, you've spent the money on the 100 gigs anyway, right? Why not use them? Um, I mean, we're using them. This is a 3D model of the inside of me from the last time I was in the MRI tube. I got out and I said, give me the data. And then I gave it to our VR guys. And so I give people tours of the inside of my body all the time. Um, and we're sharing, I'm sharing, you know, it's, I went to California. I learned a lot of things. Sharing is one of the things. And so I'm sharing the inside of my body with Chicago and we're interactively exploring me. Anyway, and then the most recent thing, I was just in Australia, and I literally I was leaving, getting on the plane, and I got word from the NSF that the, the PRP was going to be funded. Within, I don't know, 48 hours of getting to Australia, we did a joint press release that they were going to hook our net into the Pacific Research Platform so that their research universities, where they've also made investments on their campuses, can link up with our uh, university researchers. Um, and in particular, amazingly enough, it's going to be virtual reality. It's going to be the first test because they've got a cave two at Monash, um, and then there's another one at uh, in Sydney, and they're going to link those up through uh, our link with e, uh, EVL. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into the details. There are two stages of this for the networking folks in the audience. Um, the first couple of years we'll be using more conventional things. Then we'll go to a, IPv6 only. We've got some very interesting, robust uh, security aspects. Uh, we'll be bringing in more uh, SDN, SDX software, software-defined networks, um, and again, a lot of measurements. And then how you keep, you know, each group has its own secure authentication network between its researchers, even though it's on the same network. And so how do you federate these caches of data so nobody you know, is interfering with anybody else. I'll just end here. Um, you know, we've already got at least four supercomputer centers that are part of this, SDSC, NERSC at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, NASA, Ames, uh, the NCAR uh, supercomputer. 
I wouldn't know what to do if NCSA wasn't a partner in this. And it seems with Blue Waters, you know, look at all those universities, figure out where the Blue Waters users are, and let's take a few of them just as test cases. And we'd love to be engaged with you on that. Um, and I think it would be, uh, this is going to be the national system, you know, in a few years. And it'd be great for you guys to get in on the ground floor. I'll just stop here. So I saw that recently you made some predictions about the future. Could you give us a prediction about NCSA in 10 years? <laughs> well, I'm sure you all saw that President Obama signed an executive order uh, declaring that it's a national priority of the entire federal government to move as rapidly as we can to an exascale computer. You have a petascale computer. Um, that was just a couple of weeks ago, something like less than a month ago. Um, that's a big change because I've said for years there was no way we were going to get to an exascale on an agency by agency basis. And if you go back to when we first started this stuff 30 years ago, there was a much more robust inter uh, agency, uh, NSF, uh, DOE, NIH. Uh, there was a, a formal board for super for high, high first it was high performance computing, high end computing. Anyway, it kept changing its names, and uh, there was a lot of uh, engagement back and forth and dividing up the territory and you know who did what and so forth. Mutual dependency. I think that's what we're going to see for the next ten years, uh, because once you know the president, whoever it is, decides that we're going to do something in this country, that's what we're going to do. And, and so I think NSF will inevitably have to be a part of that. Um, you are, as I named you, the National Center for Supercomputing Application. So I would think you would be the logical lead. That other than that, everything is unknown about the future and there are many treacherous waters in front of us. Um, lots of evildoers could prevail. But given the path you're on, and this is one reason that I think it's essential for you to engage your end users with these kind of technologies, because frankly, if you don't, it's really constraining your future possibilities because if you think if you're projecting a few years forward the whole point of this particular call was to get a few sub national examples of what clearly NSF intends to make a national system after it's invested uh, 130 universities 65 million dollars in, in this it's not going to stop and so you need to be in the lead and and you know, Blue Waters is better set up for this than any other supercomputer center because the nature of Blue Waters is that you have these science teams that have multi-year commitments to grand challenges and you know where, they're, where those users are and they're by and large, except, you know, moving jobs, <laughs> not going anywhere. <clears throat> so your chance of making an investment and in getting the infrastructure, whether it's people time or, you know, most of the fiber is all in place and everything. It's just, it's people time to, you know, focus on it. But you have a better return on investment because they will be able to do better science having essentially blue water sitting next to their desk with this Fiona box, just like their data on their PC is, than the current way in which Blue Waters is an island separated, you know, it's like the Polynesians, you know, in canoes, you know, going between islands is the internet, right? And instead of jet planes, right, which is fiber optics. And so it will change, <clears throat> as we saw with Mike, it will change any supercomputer user's behavior pattern. Presumably it will make them uh, capable of doing things they cannot do now. And if you had, over the next few years, all of your Blue Waters science projects transform like that, um, you would be in, in 
you know, state, nobody else is, to lead to the exascale. Because if you think you're going to do a thousand times much more computing and you're still going to use this internet, that's just stupid. <clears throat> Could you say a little more about uh, Cal IT squared? I think you said there was a thousand uh, people across the two sites, a little about the breakdown between uh, um, staff, faculty, postdocs, and also what your funding model is there. What did you have for uh, uh, core funding from the state? Well, fundamentally, it's a framework for supporting cross-disciplinary research. And so there's six floors, like in the Atkinson Hall building, the one you saw uh, with the big stone bear in front um, in San Diego. That's execution space for funded projects that are multi-departmental. So if you're in the chemistry department on this university or UCSD, and you get a grant with a mathematician. There's no room in the chemistry department for a mathematician, because the chemist took it all. And there's no room in the math department for a chemist, because the mathematicians took it all. So what do you do? So we realized that there was a need here, and we built this entire facility to have rotating sets of executing uh, professionals. Now, I learned a lot of this from helping build the Beckman Institute here. There, the trouble was that although they had two dozen different cross disciplinary groups, once the lines between the groups had been set, you know, this desk is mine, that desk is yours, it pretty much stayed that way. And so ours is much more effervescent. When your grant's done, you're out, and you know, if you get another one, we'll think about it. Um, and it's also 24 different departments in the campus work with us, have grants and so forth. The rest of the building are these specialized facilities. So we built, uh, we have probably the world's best photonic systems lab uh, up on the top floor. We have um, 15,000 square feet of nanotechnology clean rooms. Uh, we've had over 100 um, companies come in and pay $100 an hour to use the clean rooms uh, to do whatever they wanted to do. Um, we've worked with over 400 companies. So <clears throat> the idea was to engage uh, the private sector much more with the university than was otherwise the case. Um, we've Can you say a little bit about the companies and what kind of things they do? Are they doing supercomputing with you, or what are they doing? Well, the SDSC is not a part of Cal IT2, that's its own entity, but we partner with them. Uh, every, the Optiputer grant was joint. Phil Papadopoulos is SDSC, I'm at Cal IT2. Um, Quartzite, which was a precursor to PRISM, was joint um, PRP, joint PIs. So we worked as much as possible on that. But no, there's no, we don't have anything to do with supercomputing time. Um, there's about a dozen different things we've learned how the private sector likes to work. First of all, the main reason they love it is their students. You know, that's, if you ask Qualcomm, how come they've given us $30 million over the 15 years? It's because, count up the number of people that work at Qualcomm that graduated from UCSD and in particular came out of Cal IT2 with this cross-training, something you don't get with most departments. Um, specialized facilities. So, for instance, our, uh, you know, having the first 4K projector in the country, uh, that enabled us to get all the Hollywood studios together to make Centigrade. Um, you know, having um, uh, the wireless labs, uh, we have a whole roof of just wireless antennas for experiment, uh, experimental purposes and so forth. So, the idea was to make everything about collaboration in it. There's no single investigators that have offices, <laughs> right? That's what your departments are for. Um, and then as a result of, you know, I have personally worked, sat down and had one-on-ones with many, many hundred faculty, both at San Diego and Irvine. And so people will come to me and they say, Larry, there's a call out and I need uh, somebody in mechanical engineering, but I, you know, I'm in biology um, who would be good? And, well, I not only know who's interested, 
not everybody is as a single investigator, uh, in collaborating, but who shows up and does work? And so I said, well, let me introduce you. And so I do that all day long. <laughs> so it, it, you know, you could have a vice chancellor for research who, who this kind of thing was part of their job description, but most universities don't. Uh, I report to the chancellor uh, as director of Cal IT2. Um, so the chancellor can also say, we'd sort of like to move the campus in this direction, but um, we'd like to show that it's already being done. Uh, so can you like set up a program in Cal IT2 and then in two years, we'll announce that we're gonna do the whole campus that way? <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of different things. I mean, it's not like, let's say it's a framework to support the work that departments and schools aren't set up to do. And it's not, that's not a criticism of schools and departments. After all, nothing we do works except for the incredible single investigators that we pull out of the departments. And we don't, by the way, pull them out. That was one of the mistakes that I think I learned at the Beckman. Um, departments don't like it if particularly their star people leave and disappear to some other part of campus and never come back. So you can't have your own personal office in Cal IT2. That's what your department's for. You come there to execute with other people multi-departmental projects. And there are 100 staff, I don't know, something like that. Any last quick question? There's, there's more time out than the sure. there, Yeah, there. go ahead. Okay, Brandy, go ahead, last question. So it's uh, really more of a comment about uh, all the efforts and projects you've done and this that you're proposing that uh, really excites me, and that's the opportunity to break things, to discover things as we go. I mean, all these things that you talked about were hugely stressful for all of us that were involved in them, <laughs> but, but also such great pride going back to all that. And, and I would really look forward to seeing NCSA really involved in that level of effort again. Yeah. And, and, you know, not just try and provide reliable support cycles for the scientists, but actually getting with those scientists that really want to push the edge and try something different. Yeah. So. Well, it's your legacy. It's where you're, it's in your DNA. And, you know, you've been through a period where the NSF has made fundamental changes. permission and to do it honestly through collaboration. Thanks. Thanks.